Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be visiting Savona, which is a small village in Steuben County, New York. Savona has always been a small village. The population peaked in the 1990s at around 1,000 people and has been on a slight decline since that time. In 1993, when the crime we are looking at took place, the 900 or so people who lived there enjoyed living in a safe, small community where most people were known to one another. Children played out in the streets and doors were often left unlocked. Our narration today concentrates on two families who lived on opposite sides of this small village. The Roby family, 34-year-old printer Dale and his 27-year-old wife Doreen lived in the church rectory at Church and McCoy Streets with their two sons, Derek, who was born on the 2nd of October 1988, and Dalton, who was a couple of years younger. Derek was a typical energetic, happy little boy. He loved to ride his bike and play t-ball, collect hickory nuts, spiders and worms. He doted on his little brother, who he would read stories to, and was getting ready to start kindergarten at the Campbell Savona School in September 1993, less than a mile away on West Lamoka Avenue. Here, Ted and Tammy Smith lived with their children. 16-year-old Stacy and 13-year-old Eric were from Tammy's previous marriage, and we know that Ted had definitely adopted Eric and possibly Stacy as well. Completing the family was Ted and Tammy's 12-year-old daughter, Holly. Ted worked at the Phillips Lighting Company manufacturing plant in nearby Bath, and Tammy looked after the family and coached the girls' softball league in which her two daughters played. On the morning of the 2nd of August 1993, the two families' lives would change and become inextricably linked forever. During the school break, Savona Village Park held a day camp which many of the local children attended. In this small community, children would often walk to the camp in groups without adult supervision. The park was around 350 metres from Dale and Doreen's house. It was along a straight road with no crossings. Four-year-old Derek, who was fiercely independent, liked to walk to the camp on his own. His mother, Doreen, would watch from their home, checking to see that he met up with the group of children who were also headed to the day camp at the park. On the morning of Monday the 2nd of August 1993, Derek was keen to get to summer camp, but his younger brother, Dalton, was fussing. Doreen watched as he headed off on his walk, but returned inside to take care of her younger son. Thunderstorms had been forecast for that day, so less children were attending, and Derek made the last part of his journey alone and unsupervised. He was a bright boy who knew he had to stay on the pavement and had learned that he should never talk to or go off with strangers. At 9.15am, a local man, Bill Horn, drove past and waved at the young boy. Shortly after that, 13-year-old Eric cycled up to Derek and began talking to him. Eric said to Derek that they should go into the nearby wooded area as it was a shortcut to the park. Although Eric was not a complete stranger to Derek, they went to the same summer camp and would have seen each other out and about around the village. The little boy refused. Eric kept asking, but Derek continued to refuse until Eric told him that going through the woods was a shortcut and that they would be everyone else to the camp. At that particular point, Derek agreed to go through the woods. At 9.30am, Eric arrived at the park alone. Around an hour later, a thunderstorm struck in the area and the summer camp was cancelled for the day. When Doreen arrived to collect Derek, she was informed that he had not arrived that day. By 11.04 a.m., Derek was reported missing. The state police were called and local people came out in droves to help look for young Derek. 
At 3.45pm came the devastating news that Derek's body had been found in a lightly wooded area just off of McCoy Street in between the village park and his home. He had been strangled and beaten to death. Security in the small community was shattered. Initial reports stated that the police were looking for a suspicious person seen in a green pickup truck in the village and that they were also looking into similarities between Derek's murder and the case of Jimmy Bernardo, a 12-year-old boy who had been abducted from Pittsfield, Massachusetts and killed three years earlier. Residents were scared, children were no longer allowed out to play and the community was devastated by the senseless loss of this beautiful young boy. By the 5th of August, 40 full-time investigators had been brought in to work on the case, but the police did not have any suspects. Campbell Savona Elementary School, where Derek was due to start in kindergarten the following month, announced that the baseball field would be named in his memory. Derek was laid to rest on the 7th of August, Around 700 people waited in line to pay their respects to the young boy. By this time, the police had announced that they believed the killer was a local person. Six days after Derek's murder, 13-year-old Eric's great-grandfather, who was a retired sheriff, noticed some discrepancies in Eric's story about the day of the murder and realised that Eric was involved. He took his great-grandson to the district attorney's office in Bath, where Eric told the police that he had killed Derek. During his confession, Eric said that he was riding along McCoy Street on his bicycle, heading towards the summer camp in the park. He saw Derek walking to that same camp and stopped to talk to him. Eric said that he told Derek that he knew a shortcut through the woods, but Derek refused to go with him, saying that he was not allowed to go with strangers. Eric asked again, and Derek refused a second time, but when Eric said that they would beat everyone else to camp that morning, Derek finally agreed to go. Once they were in the woods, Eric admitted that he had choked the younger boy before hitting him in the head multiple times with a small rock. He then dropped a larger rock, later established to weigh 26 pounds, which is almost 12 kilos, onto Derek's head, smashing in his skull. Eric continued to throw rocks onto Derek's chest before opening the lunch that Doreen had prepared for her son and stuffing a napkin into Derek's mouth and then pouring Kool-Aid over his head and into the wounds. The right part area where he had hit him with his rocks all these times, he said three, hit him in the head and there was some blood there. He took the Kool-Aid and, and he did his hands like this, he said, so he took the Kool-Aid and I poured it into those cuts. Those are his words, I poured it into the cuts. I said, what forever did you do that for? I don't know, I just did. Finally, Eric broke a twig from a tree and sodomised Derek's lifeless body. Once finished, Eric had got back onto his bike and headed towards the recreation programme, but then decided to return a few minutes later to check that Derek was definitely dead. Eric then went and joined the summer camp, arriving at around 9.30am. After this confession, Eric was charged with second-degree murder, which was the only capital crime for which a 13-year-old could be tried as an adult. As a consequence, he was then held at the Monroe County Children's Centre. He appeared in court the following day and showed little emotion as he sat quietly and confirmed that he understood the charges against him. He was refused bail. As news of the arrest spread, two very different pictures of Eric began to emerge. Some news reports described a young boy who enjoyed spending time with his grandparents, loved riding his bike, fishing, and also playing the drums. He was outgoing and polite, a fair student who was a bit mischievous at time. He would sometimes get into trouble at school, but nothing that was particularly serious. However, other reports described a young boy with a bad temper who was quick to fight and that something about him just wasn't right. He would often struggle to make friends and would hang around with younger kids. Was he a bully or a victim of bullying? A show-off or a withdrawn loner? The answer would vary depending upon who was being interviewed. On the 5th of September, 
a memorial concert was held in honour of Derek to celebrate his life and raise money to cover his funeral expenses and to help his family move home. The concert raised over $25,000 with the additional money going towards a college fund for Derek's younger brother, Dalton. On the same day as this concert, Eric was indicted on a second degree murder charge and it was confirmed that he would be tried as an adult. In a three minute court appearance on the 10th of September, he pled not guilty. Eric underwent significant medical testing from specialists for both the prosecution and the defence and it was decided that he was mentally competent to stand trial. His defence lawyer attempted to get the trial moved to family court where Eric would receive a much lighter sentence if convicted and the lawyer also attempted to get Eric's confession suppressed on the basis that Eric was never told that he would be prosecuted, only that he would get psychiatric help. Both of these attempts were unsuccessful. Due to the physical evidence and Eric's confession, the only defence available was not guilty by reason of insanity. The case eventually went to trial on the 26th of July 1994. The issue that the six men and six women of the jury needed to decide upon was not whether or not Eric had killed Derek, but his state of mind at the time of the killing. Eric sat in court looking small and vulnerable, wearing a Bugs Bunny t-shirt, looking far younger than his 14 years. The prosecution stated that there was nothing in Eric's brain function or hormone tests that explained his violent behaviour. They argued that the fact that Eric had asked Derek to accompany him into the woods multiple times demonstrated that he was in control of himself and not in an uncontrollable violent rage. They backed this up further by stating that because Eric went back to check that Derek was dead, it showed that he was aware of what he had done. Derek's family wholeheartedly rejected the defence that Eric could not control or be responsible for his actions. Although a motive was never clearly established, it was suggested that Eric's actions may have been driven by Derek having everything in life that he himself would want. The defence provided testimony from a psychiatrist stating that they had diagnosed Eric with intermittent explosive disorder. This is a behavioural disorder that is characterised by uncontrollable explosive outbursts of anger and violence with three of the main indicators being bedwetting, fire setting, and cruelty to animals. Eric Smith suffers from a mental disease that can be characterized as a rage disorder. He builds up inside himself from whatever sources produce anger, he builds up rage. And it doesn't express itself, and then the rage explodes. The defence said that Eric had a sadistic side which was beyond his control, which they believe was due to developmental abnormalities brought on by trimethodione, which was a drug that his mother took for epilepsy whilst pregnant. It is by far and away the most toxic drug for a pregnant woman to be on. It can cause major congenital malformations. There are a variety of minor anomalies, which are things like low set ears, widely spaced eyes, which are more minor and cosmetic. And then there are neurologic problems like mental retardation, learning disorders that can range in severity, but are also relatively common. They stated that the crime was not premeditated and was as a result of pathological rage caused by mental illness. Testimony from many of those close to Eric painted a distressing picture of his life, but would this ultimately lead to him being found not guilty by reason of insanity? Eric's stepfather, Ted Smith testified about an incident where Eric had come to him for help the previous spring, stating that after repeated arguments with his older sister, he felt like he was going to hurt someone. Ted said that he suggested to Eric that he use the punching bag to let out his aggression. Eric later returned and said that he had taken care of it. He had been repeatedly punching a tree until his knuckles were bloody. Eric's parents would also testify that Eric had been bullied at school for his red hair, glasses and learning difficulties. 
He had a speech problem that would cause him to slur and spit, and he would become incredibly frustrated when people didn't understand him. It was also further disclosed that Eric had learnt that Ted wasn't his biological father at the age of nine through taunting from his classmates. There was further tension in the family caused by the fact that his older sister was showered with gifts from their grandparents on their biological father's side of the family, whilst the same grandparents refused to even acknowledge Eric's existence. Eric was often sick and withdrawn and continued to wet the bed until he was 11 years old. Then, more disturbing details of Eric's past behaviour came to light. At the age of three, he had got up in the middle of the night and set fire to a pile of paperwork in the kitchen. He had become obsessed with fire. In 1989, at the age of nine, Eric had strangled a neighbour's cat with a garden hose because he found the cat bothersome. His stepfather admitted to having a temper and sometimes hitting Eric and the picture of a disturbing home life was further supported by Eric's older sister, Stacy. Stacy, who was only 16, had moved out of the family home in June 1993 and described her life there as hell. She said that the children were always being yelled at and there was a significant amount of both verbal and physical abuse. A psychiatrist for the defence stated that Stacy had said that her stepfather had sexually touched her twice, after which she became depressed and took an overdose. She had filed charges at the time, but later, at the apparent insistence of her mother, she then told social workers that she had lied. She then went on to describe Eric as the most caring member of the family. After listening to all the evidence, the jury retired and deliberated for around eight hours before returning their verdict. At 9.44pm on the 16th of August 1994, they found Eric guilty of second degree murder. On the 7th of November, he was given the maximum sentence for his crime, which was from nine years to life in prison. He showed no emotion during the reading of the sentence in Steuben County Court. Whilst in jail, he read an apology letter to Derek's family on television in which he stated, I know my actions have caused a terrible loss in the Roby family, and for that, I am truly sorry. I've tried to think as much as possible about what Derek will never experience. His 16th birthday, Christmas, any time, owning his own house, graduating, going to college, getting married, his first child. If I could go back in time, I would switch places with Derek and endure all the pain that I've caused him. If it meant that he would go on living, I'd switch places, but I can't. On the 5th of November 1994, a statue honouring Derek's short life was unveiled at Savona Village Park. Derek's great uncle, Steve Huey, sculpted the clay figure which was then bronzed by students at Alfred University. Eric spent several years in a juvenile facility before being moved to a maximum security adult prison. There were various infractions during his time here, including disobeying a direct order, smoking and kissing another inmate. He was consistently denied parole every two years. From 2005 onwards, Eric maintained a clean prison disciplinary record and in his 2012 parole hearing, he stated that he had not appreciated the impact of his actions at the time and that he had shut down emotionally due to his own bullying and abuse. He said that he had selected his victim knowing that Derek was vulnerable and that he could overpower him. He went on to state that he had been working through his issues on a therapeutic program inside the prison and truly believed that this had helped him. He was however again denied parole after the board cited a concern for public safety if he were released. By 2020 he had been refused parole on 10 separate occasions. This was to change at his 11th hearing in October 2021 when he was granted parole and after his release was delayed due to him not having an approved residence to go to, he became a free man on the 1st of February 2022 at the age of 41. 
He had served 27 years in prison for his crime. If he was still alive today, Derek would be 33 years old. His headstone reads, In our hearts you will remain forever young. My heart goes out to Derek and his family for this truly shocking crime. Rest in peace, Derek. Thanks for listening to this case. Please add any comments, click like, and if you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. The plaque on the memorial statue at Savona Village Park is inscribed with the words dedicated to a gentle reminder of what childhood is meant to be. Goodbye.